Hello and good evening. Welcome to the Knights of Last Call. My name is Derek Melinda, welcoming you here tonight as we are brought together for a very sad occasion, but one that hopefully we can uh, sort of all celebrate and remember. The life of Janelle Jaquez, who uh, I did not know personally, but I knew her through her work. And we'll talk a little bit tonight about some of the awesome stuff that she did. Uh, she recently passed uh, just this past week. And uh, I asked my patrons what kind of stream we wanted to do tonight. And I had thrown out a suggestion earlier in uh, the week when we learned about her passing about potentially doing a stream. And every patron voted for that. So here we are to talk about uh, Janelle Jaquez. Uh, in lieu of any super chats or tips that you might be uh, uh, giving me, uh, as per usual, uh, I recommend, I highly suggest, if you can, to take a look in the description below. There's a link to a GoFundMe page. Sadly, that page was originally set up by Janelle's wife to help cover medical expenses while she battled a long-term illness and autoimmune disease that ultimately claimed her life. However, as is the sad case uh, for a lot of families in America, the death of a loved one often leaves behind not only an incredible loss, but a ton of medical debt, funeral expenses, logistics, bureaucratic nightmare. So that GoFundMe is still live, and uh, Janelle's wife has asked that if anybody can donate and help cover the um, crushing amount of medical debt that they have, uh, that uh, she would be appreciative of that. So... You know, no pressure, but, you know, if you have a couple bucks, two, three, four, five bucks, just uh, maybe head over to the link now or head over to the link later and uh, and and drop any money that you would have given me tonight. Just give it over to uh, to Janelle and Janelle's family. So welcome, everybody. Uh, I'm not going to try to again. I did not know Janelle personally. Um, I did not have the opportunity to meet her, um, although I well, I we met, but I didn't meet her, meet her. Um, at uh, 2017 Origins, uh, she was inducted into the uh, Academy of Board Games. I'm trying to remember the name of it. It's like the Academy of Board Game Sciences. Um, it's like the Hall of Fame. It's, it's at Origins. And um, she was inducted as an RPG designer in 2017. I was there. I saw the, you know, the presentation. So in that way, I guess I met her once, but... Uh, never had a chance to, get to talk to her. I only knew her through her work and kind of in three stages, which I'll kind of talk about a little bit. And we, you know, you let me know how we want to do this and what we want to do. Um, so again, I started playing D and D in the, you know, early nineties. Um, and so, you know, I grew up on second edition and stuff like that. And so I wasn't really aware of too many people in the industry other than, you know, Gary Gygax, Dave Arneson, mm -hmm. And some of the, the 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 other TSR folks, but as I uh, sort of got really uh, became an adult and and started getting more into the game, um, I kept hearing this this name of this designer Jaquez, and how she had sort of uh, revolutionized the industry. And as I was sort of learning about her, um, I discovered that, and this kind of all sort of made sense to me. So this is like the first place where it was kind of like, oh damn. OK, is she obviously, from our perspective, has a ton of famous uh, qualities due to her uh, contributions to TTRPGs. However, she also, for many, many years, worked with some of the most influential video game designers as well, particularly id Software, as in Quake and Hexen. And these were games that like defined my teenage years and probably even my early adulthood. Um, I played a ton of Quake and... Uh, Quake One, Quake Two, Quake Three, and she she was a level designer. She helped, you know, design the what essentially is a dungeon, um, and it totally makes sense because the way that she had approached um, Dungeons and Dragons and RPGs and the way that she designed her dungeons is the uh, way that she designed her levels in Quake. So in a sense, I was introduced to her work without knowing it was her through games like Quake and and enjoying the the level design, right? So the second way that 
I eventually came to know her as I, as I became more of a student of the hobby. Uh, at the time, it was the 2000s, early 2000s, third edition was King. And I, in particular, loved the publication house known as Necromancer Games. And Necromancer Games in 2004 released a book, which at the time I just thought it was a book, but it turns out it was a re-release. And that was the Caverns of Thracia. And this was a sort of a, a, a combination between Necromancer Games and Judges Guild, who had originally uh, released the, uh, the module. And, but I, I didn't know about that module, but that module apparently was a classic. So this was, a, um, was, was how I was introduced to her work in the RPG space uh, for the first time. And I, I loved it. I fell in love with it. I thought it was such an awesome adventure. And uh, there's a lot of stuff in here that we can go into about why I thought this was such a cool adventure and just the way it was designed. Um, and, you know, just really impressed with the way that she approached it. Now, the third way that I was introduced to Janelle Jaquez is something that I've seen a couple of times in chat. And I do want to kind of clear, make sure that we're very clear about this. Um, in 20, 2010, 2011, something like that, uh, I could be wrong about the exact year, uh, Justin Alexander from the Alexandrian blog, the, uh, you know, the, the guy who just released uh, So You Want to uh, Be a Game Master or whatever. Uh, he did a article about dungeon design and he used the term, uh, Jaquaying the dungeon because he was inspired kind of like I was just Justin Alexander is an actual author and capable of writing more than five words at a time. Uh, and he was inspired by, by the original design of Caverns of Thracia, as well as, uh, Janelle's other work to create a, uh, sort of a framework for how we should design dungeons. Now, many years later, Janelle approached Justin and wasn't mad at him, but basically politely asked him to not call it that. Um, for a couple of reasons, it, it had become known as Jaquaying the dungeon, and she was very protective of her last name, which is Jaquais with an S at the end, and Jaquaying didn't have that. And also, she just uh, you know personally didn't feel like she created that term. That wasn't her idea. He was inspired by her work to create it. He was trying to pay an um, homage to her. And she basically said, you know, that that's very nice of you, but no thanks. Um, and so Justin Alexander, stand-up guy that he is, uh, went on sort of a, you know, back and forth with her and said, okay, well, you know, I need to, uh, I'm writing a book about it. I want to call about something. And she suggested that he call it Xandering the dungeon, as in, you know, Alexandrian, the article, the blog's source, or the blog that was the article source, and he agreed, and he's spent some amount of time trying to, you know, clean up meta tags and make sure that the term Xandering is used. Now, I'm going to use Xandering to the best of my abilities. To be fair, for 13 plus years, 12 plus years, I called it Jaquaying the dungeon, but I wish to respect Janelle's wishes. And I certainly wish to, to respect Justin's wishes, the author of the, uh, of the book and the article. And they both prefer the term Xandering. So we'll try to use Xandering. But the important thing to remember is that Xandering the dungeon is a methodology of creating non-linear dungeons that was inspired by the work of Janelle Jaquez. Now, most of the... Okay, you know, most of the things that we're going to talk about tonight, if we get, you know, as we talk about them, you're going to say, I've heard this on your channel before. Um, and, and the answer is, yeah, because uh, that this module and uh, that article uh, were both, I think, very, uh, you know, I, I, I read this in 2004. So I was I was only like 22 or something when I read this. So for me, this was kind of uh, still pretty early in my my RPG career. Uh, and so for me, this was a, a, fun, a fun, fundamental way to shift the way that I view design. And then Justin Alexander took it a next step further when he created his Xandering the Dungeon article and really sort of wrote down this formulae process. Now, the fourth thing, which I'm not going to lie, I didn't know. <laughs> I didn't know until recently uh, when she got ill, but I didn't realize that uh, Janelle Jaquez was also an artist. And I was amazed to find that uh, so many pieces throughout the history of Dungeons and Dragons and other games 
you know, Chaosium games and Fossa games and just uh, Dungeon Crawl classics. She was doing art, you know, up until the last several years. Uh, I was amazed. I did. I what a you know, <laughs> what a, a sort of a. I don't even know. Um, what a polymath, right? Someone who is a video game designer and a TTRPG Hall of Fame inductee and an artist. Um, and so I didn't actually know about uh, her artwork. So uh, I, I went and kind of looked through a, a collage of her art and I found some of the pieces that I was like, oh, I know this piece or I recognize that piece or, oh, I like that piece. And I threw them in the slideshow for tonight, uh, the intro. So any case, Again, welcome. Uh, we're here tonight to talk about sort of the legacy of Janelle Jaquez, as particularly as through the lens through which I know it, which is the Caverns of Thracia. And then uh, if you wish to make a, a support or donation, a tip or anything like that, I, my recommendation is that you don't. And instead, check out the link below. That'll take you to uh, uh, Janelle and her wife's uh, GoFundMe page to help cover her um, late wife's expenses that uh, that unfortunately now include things like uh, funeral arrangements. So uh, certainly our, you know, our hearts are heavy. Our thoughts and prayers are with Janelle's family and, um, you know, anybody who worked with her knew her uh, in a more personal level. All right. Well, again, I don't want it to be super duper overly somber, but uh, we're here to learn. So, yeah. So um, let's see. You know, it's funny. Uh Yesterday, or it's Tuesday, we had like the single largest live stream we've ever had. Um, it was kind of crazy. Um, and so to kind of, you know, kind of go from, uh, you know, talk being super hyped about, you know, a uh, new RPG and talking about some of the pros and cons of it to sort of unfortunately shifting the gears a bit and talking about something else um, that is uh, unfortunately a, a bit sad. Uh, all right. Well, there's a couple ways that we can we can talk about this. Um I have, I have Caverns of Thracia pulled up, and we're going to go through Caverns of Thracia. A couple things about Caverns, Caverns of Thracia um, that you need to know. For starters, or for, for starters, uh, this is, again, what I know. And this is a heavily, heavily, heavily influenced. I mean, the maps are the same, and, you know, it's a little bit added, but this is a remake of Janelle Jaquay's actual real Caverns of Thracia. The actual real Caverns of Thracia came out in the 1970s. It was a Judges Guild product. Now, unfortunately, uh, due to the fact that the president of the Judges Guild uh, company is, uh, uh, I don't want to slander anybody here, but has uh, a history of being uh, kind of a terrible person, uh, a lot of companies, including Drive Through RPG, have stopped uh, carrying Judges Guild products. So, as a result, you, you cannot, at least, at least legally, uh, to my knowledge, you can't get um, the original Caverns of Thracia PDF. Um, but I do think you can find this uh, on Drive Through RPG because it was technically released by Necromancer Games, which is a subdivision of sword and sorcery studios which was a subdivision of white wolf um so if you're interested in you know taking a look at this old thir third edition <laughs> module uh you could definitely do it but the other thing that i thought we could start with before we kind of get into the caverns of thracia is sort of talking about um um uh, about the concept of xandering the dungeon and kind of understand the sort of precepts I'm, again this is nothing that janelle herself ever wrote down but it was definitely the way that she designed her dungeons is the way that i designed my dungeons and that that style that procedure that is what i follow today um so we are going to start with the whiteboard there gm scott yes um and uh we'll, but we'll, we'll hopefully make our way back to the pdf um RPG Music says, Judges Guild posted a tribute, quote, okay, quotations on Facebook, that dead named Janelle. And you will know I will not dead name Janelle, and uh, I, I have no intention to. Um, yeah, just that's a hell of a thing to do. No respect, even in death. Well, hopefully we can pay a little bit of respect um, onto her name and you know celebrate uh, the person that she is instead of trying to, you know, whatever. I'm not going to get down. 
the Judges Guild has its own. You can Google it. You can look it up. But uh, it's not entirely it's not entirely unwarranted. All of the the bad press that they've gotten, which is unfortunate because you know there's a lot of cool stuff. Wilderlands of high fantasy are, is a pretty cool setting, and there's a lot of classic stuff there that is really awesome. Um, all right, let's start. All right, let's get open. Let's get open the whiteboard. All right. All right. Okay. All right. Um, so, and again, this is this is a sort of. If you've watched this channel, then you definitely have seen me talk about this stuff before. So, what does it mean to Xander the dungeon? And again, if you really want like a a, a super in depth to this, I, my recommendation is you know is check out um, the Alexandrian blog and. Blog, and that will definitely give you uh, just a ton more information about this. And, and he did a fantastic job of sort of uh, breaking that down. But let's talk about like what 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 does it mean to Xander a dungeon? All right. So the key here, and, and this is what you'll see when we take a look at caverns of Thracia. And again, we're not going to be able to go you know literally detail step by step by it. But I, I want to I want you to appreciate. Number one, how awesome of a designer she was. But also, too, as I go talk through this and I talk about her design, you'll realize you're like, oh, wow, this is this is a huge influence to Derek. This is what he talks about a lot. So, um, uh, Shadram says, hey, uh, yeah, his new you, So You Want to Be a Game Master book has a lot of detail on this, too, and it's a really good book of GM advice. I have not finished it yet, but I, I was impressed with what I read so far. And so, you know, we'll, I can, I, Fully believe that. <laughs> it's a great book. Um, <laughs> uh, let's see. Jaquay's Dark Tower has for, uh, forever inspired me to leave invisible treasure chests in my dungeons. Yeah. And so, you know, uh, Ben kind of uh, kicking us off there. I, I didn't mention Dark Tower, but that is the other module for which she is most well known. But I'd be completely honest with you. I have almost no experience with that module short of knowing that it exists. Uh, but um that's awesome that, you know, you, uh, you also were influenced by that, but we'll talk about from my perspective about what does it mean to sort of Xander the dungeon, AKA in the style of Janelle Jaquez. Now, um, the first thing is, is a non-linear design. And again, you know, props to, to Justin Alexander for sort of, you know, breaking this down. Basically, a lot of the things that I talk about on this channel, all right, which is creating loops in your dungeon and not creating one true path to get to the room, this is nonlinear design. This is instead of straightforward linear paths, this means we're talking about multiple routes, okay, M numerous um, exits hidden passages that actually do something and mean something. Okay. And just agency, 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 right? Players are constantly given choices on how they want to choose uh, their path. And, you know, we've talked about this on the, uh, on the channel before, but like uh, as an example, as an example, Oh, ah, sorry. I don't know what that did. <laughs> Apparently this is an example of how to use the eraser and it that felt like that's what I wanted to do by selecting the eraser. Thank you eraser. Um, okay. If you have a dungeon, right? That let's say you have your entrance here and it goes to a room that has an encounter and there's like a passageway over here but it doesn't really go anywhere, it just goes to a closet. And then there's a passage here and you can go to that room and then this doesn't really, this goes to here, but these just lead both to the same location. And then there's like one room that is optional. And then you've got 
the final boss. Okay. So this dungeon um, is fairly linear because there's really only one true path through the dungeon and it's to get to here. Um, I mean, you could go that way, but you know, the number of choices that you're making is very, very, very small. And so now to be clear, this is a very economic design. Um, it's very good if you're, for example, maybe you're writing a book and you're trying to sell an adventure and you're worried about page count and you're worried about GMs feeling like they are going to get all their money's worth because the, the, the chances are like, you know, with hundred percent certainty that they are going to encounter this encounter, this encounter, this encounter, and this encounter. If for whatever reason, your group followed this literal straight line path, the only thing they would miss is two of the six encounters and chances are fairly good that they're going to get at least one of them. And so if you're trying to maximize, you know, the, 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 how the word value of your adventure, then this can be valuable. However, I think that, that is uh, <laughs> horse trading that I don't want to take place in. I think that this design leads to lack of agency and ultimately feels railroaded. And Jim Scott brings up a really good point that I want to talk about. Worth mentioning that linear doesn't necessarily mean straight. Yes. Um, by the way, I hate everything about modern day apps. And every time I'm using something, and it pops me up with prompts like, how likely are you to recommend whiteboard? Or are you enjoying using Reddit? I, it, I, I, kid, I shit you not, it, I have a, just a flash of, I'm just gonna delete this and never use it again. It's like, yes, I love it. I think it's fantastic. But you prompting that up to me while I am using your app drives me insane. Um, anyways. So yeah, so uh, there's this idea then that uh, linear, a dungeon can be linear even if it's, uh, you know, crooked and stuff. If you have, you know, there's, there's, you have some stairs down into the dungeon and they go into a room and then that room leads to a corridor and it turns left and it goes right. And there's a chamber here, but it has no other entrances or exits. So it's like, you're basically still going on this and it goes over to here and over here. And then it goes into this other chamber and, you know, yeah, sure. You, you made a bunch of right hand turns and you, you know, you could have technically even checked out this sort of chamber, which is just, again, it's not really increasing the number of options that you have because it just, you kind of go in and go out. But even though you've made a bunch of turns, this is still extremely linear design. And it, it might even, it might not feel as literally linear as just like a series of connected straight hallways that lead to the final boss. But the fact of the matter is that this is still um, bad design. So when I think about Xandering the dungeon, I think about non-linear design. That means multiple routes. Think loops. Think um, uh, legitimate choices that could potentially lead to a very different play experience. And, and we'll get to, well, we can talk about that now, I guess. The thing that really, for me, sets the tone let me tell you something. I have run that, that sets the tone of a dungeon of, of, of a, in my opinion, a truly great dungeon. I have run Sunless Citadel so many times. I've run it in third edition. I ran it in 3.5 edition. Um, I even did like a variation of it for fourth edition. I've run it in fifth edition twice. So I have run this module for me. It's probably the module that I have run the most. Sunless Citadel, you know, for those of you who don't know, it's from Tales of the Yawning Portal, but it was originally released in third edition. And, you know, it's first level adventure. And let me tell you something. Without, you know, with a, some um, occasional minor variance, every group I have run through Sunless Citadel has experienced the same encounters, had the same outcomes, and ultimately had um, a very similar experience. They went through the dungeon in the similar way. And yes, you know, it's not 100% and not everything is literally on a straight railroad, but by and large, it is an extremely linear experience. And as a result, when I run the Sunless Citadel, every experience is the same. Now contrast this with something like Keep on the Borderlands and uh, our, our friend uh, Ryan from the from the channel, Ryan Dale, was recently, we were, we were both sharing stories of us running... Um, 
keep on the borderlands caves of chaos with our groups and talking about how radically different the experience this was encounters that that he ran that almost devastated his party encounters that my group skipped um entire cave systems that we didn't explore how one encounter played out compared to another encounter so caves of chaos to me is an example of a well-designed non-linear dungeon it has multiple routes it has numerous entrances and exits and and the key here is things that they, they have to mean something i'm not trying to uh you know belabor a, a point and try to like you know um, praise old school design but you know one of the things is like let's say that there is a chamber okay and it is full of treasure Okay. And, you know, we've got a dungeon over here, you know, big dungeon. And, you know, the party finds this passageway that leads up to here and has access to this dungeon room, but there is a nasty monster inside of it. Okay. Something that, uh, you know, again, because this is an adventure path, you don't have to fight this thing. But if you want that treasure, boy, you're going to have to fight that monster. But what if while exploring over here, the group, through maybe some clever play, some good problem solving, discovers a secret door. And what if that secret door takes them right into the treasure chamber? This is obviously a component of nonlinear design because it, it, it's about hidden passages. But it also gets me to my second point about, in my opinion, about Xandering the dungeon, which is exploration is rewarded. And, you know, if you played Quake, you saw this all the time. Uh, and again, you know, in Janelle's design in Quake, which is you could just shoot through the level. You could just, you know, shoot down the monsters. And, and there's a certain sense to that, right? You're trying to conserve ammunition, conserve health. But by and large, if you spent the time to explore and look around and mess with stuff and see if something was a secret door or see where this extra passageway went or notice that you could jump from one thing, then suddenly you're, you're taking an increased risk because you might encounter more monsters. Maybe this won't pay off, but you know what? It oftentimes did. What gets rewarded gets repeated. I've said this a million times. Um, and so when, when you create a dungeon or you create even an adventure place and you think about what will happen if my group does go off the beaten path? Are they just going to get punished with extra random encounters and uh, you know, a bunch of monster encounters that are just going to kick their butts? If you do that, then the players are going to go, oh, okay, I get it. Exploration is not something we should be doing. If you're playing in a game <clears throat> like a milestone, like if you're playing a traditional modern D20 game, right? Let's say that you're, you know, you're going, I use XP is milestone. So the group levels up when they reach the next story beat, usually after they beat whatever boss or villain is, you know, present from that particular part of the adventure or that particular part of the chapter. And then I also use, um, you know, auto scaling. Um, what is it called? Uh, in Pathfinder two, it's called, um, uh, automatic bonus progression, right? APB, basically, you know, magic items, auto scale. And, you know, in terms of magical items, I am, I am going strict by the GM's G guidelines about how much treasure I should award. And I want to make sure everybody stays completely in line. Well, when you run a game like that, you are not rewarding exploration. Exploration is not going to get the party anywhere or anything. And so if you have things like XP as a milestone, if you have things like automatic bonus progression or magical item scaling, or, or you just give out magical items on a very strict schedule per the book, do not be surprised when your players do not choose to explore because what is that really doing for them? It's not doing anything. So to Xander, a dungeon is to not only make it non-linear and have multiple routes and hidden accesses, multiple routes and numerous exits and hidden passages. But it's also about making those hidden passages part of a framework of rewarding exploration. The group that explores should learn more about the dungeon and that should matter, okay? Like if the group 
explores and they pay attention and they see a scene and it shows, you know, this powerful ghostly dragon and the ghostly dragon looks to be getting destroyed by this black flame. Well, then maybe later in the dungeon, when they find this like scepter of black flame, they go, oh, we can use that against the ghostly dragon and it'll be really effective. Again, you're rewarding them for exploring your dungeon. You're rewarding them with not just treasure, but you're also rewarding them with uh, information, lore, uh, just uh, uh, better access, um, avoiding, ma- ma- avoiding, sometimes it's giving them a bonus. Sometimes it's avoiding a penalty. Hey, you can avoid that fight. Hey, you can avoid those random encounters because of the exploration that you did, because you discovered a new place. And also exploration being rewarded. Sometimes is, sometimes exploration is its own reward. Make Make cool designs and cool places that really tell the story of your location. And, you know, Players aren't completely heartless bastards. They can be like, hey, I I thought that was really cool. I thought that was a great chamber. I personally feel rewarded for having explored this part of the dungeon. Or sometimes a dungeon can be very different. Maybe the Western crypts have a very different vibe and a very different feel than maybe the rest of the dungeon, which is, uh, you know, maybe it's a different style of monsters. Maybe the Western crypts are, you know, entirely populated by undead. Uh, or maybe they're not. Maybe they're uh, benevolent undead and they're they're there to aid the party. Maybe they have a little society there. The party who goes and finds that is going to feel rewarded for that. So for me, again, nonlinear design and rewarding exploration. So the third element of Xandering a Dungeon, and we kind of touched on, we just kind of touched on this, is um, environmental storytelling so the dungeon's layout its room descriptions the visual elements these can be used okay so we're talking the the layout itself we're talking the rooms the descriptions okay the visuals convey a sense of story. I, again, this is, uh, this is, this is, this is straight out of Caverns of Thracia. So you'll say that you'll see this, you know, if you watched our nightlife, you saw that I talk about that, uh, like, you know, like, like ogres, right? Dungeons are like onions. They have layers. And, you know, I like to think of, you know, sort of the history of a dungeon or a site, you know, it doesn't have to necessarily be a quote unquote dungeon, but it, it's like an archeological expedition, right? You're going down through layers of history. I'm not just talking about the levels of the dungeon. I'm talking about like, you know, 4,000 years ago when in, you know, the primordial times and the great uh, Imperial uh, arc mage, you know, first discovered this magical site and constructed his great tower. And then he was destroyed by an invading army of demons in the year 3000. And then for, several years or you know for several millennia demons uh controlled the dungeon and they they twisted it with horrendous portals to all manner of nefarious locations and then 1500 years ago was the great crusade where an army of holy paladins returned to the site to purge it of its demonic influence and they made it into sort of like a a bastion a, a capstone to keep eternal watch over the you know uh the demonic portals. But then after a thousand years, their ancient order fell into dispute and reprise. You know, you're building a history of the site and environmental storytelling. You know, you don't have to beat people over the head with that. You don't have to sit there with your module and go, okay, in this year, in this year, in this year, this happened and this year, this happened and this year, this happened. Instead, the group will learn it through the dungeon passively the hey i know you know a player might notice hey why is why do these rooms look so different than these other rooms and then you see you know it, it, a good example of environmental storytelling right is like uh moria in lord of the rings right the the what happened there and the balrog is sort of foretold through the nature of the of the dungeon And so as a result, when the Balrog appears, you're not like totally surprised because 
the environment helped you get to that point. And so environmental storytelling it, for me is so important. And there are some people that I play with like Aaron Smith who are really, really good at picking up on these clues, these subtle clues. And this isn't like a perception check as much as a, or a recall knowledge or a lore. Although I think that those things can add an, an additional level of, of depth. But for me, this is first and foremost, right? We, we talked about the, the rules of dungeon craft. And the third rule of Dungeoncraft is a good adventure should challenge the PCs and it should challenge the players. And so for me, environmental storytelling, in fact, I say the best dungeons, the Xander dungeons done in the style of Janelle Jaquais, do that really well. They challenge the players and they challenge the PCs. So environmental storytelling, huge part of it. Um, four, puzzles. Uh, traps, challenges, basically non-combat encounters. Um, anybody who has gamed with me for a long period of time knows that if I ever run any sort of like big dungeon, I almost always include puzzles. And I'm talking about like real puzzles. And I know some people hate that. I know that some people hate that. They want their character to make an intelligence check and that's totally respectable, but I am here to, but, and, and to be clear, if the way forward through the adventure path and at, you know, we've all signed up to play the adventure path. Okay. And if in order for the adventure path to get to the next stage, you have to solve the riddle of the, of the timescape, then yeah, I don't think that you, you know, I could see the, the case for saying, why do I have to be good at puzzles to play this game? But in my case, you know, tying into the idea of environmental storytelling, uh, exploration being rewarded and nonlinear design. Most of the time, things like my puzzles and traps and challenges, well, nothing in my dungeon is required. And so a puzzle might guard a secret vault of treasure. It might guard a secret passage. It might guard a secondary wing. It could guard an entire sub level or it could guard lore or, or some additional information that could help the party maybe defeat a particularly fearsome monster or the location of a, of a really potent magical item that is deeper in the dungeon, but they don't have to beat it. And so I feel very comp, you know, I feel very confident in this. And again, going back to quake, um, I think one of the reasons why quake and it's, and it's six sequels were so good is everybody thinks of it as like, you know, the FPS game. And to be fair, I mean, you know, that's makes sense. It is a first person shooter game. But I, I always have felt that like Quake had and the Quake games had more elements to it than you might see at first blush. And I think that a lot of modern FPS games, one of the reasons why I stopped playing FPS games is because I really do feel like they became more about just like running around and shooting the enemies. And it was more about, ha, you know, how much ammo do I have? How much guns do I have? Um, and again, I was younger and the industry wasn't as uh, advanced as it is now, but I definitely remember that feeling of like, oh, okay, I get this. This chamber has, you know, this this danger. If I if I go in, I could draw the people out and I could take them over to the bridge and then I could fight them one at a time. And then I, I have a better chance of actually beating this and, you know, beating this series of monsters. Again, it's like a challenge. It's It's using my brain, not just my character sheet, you know, not just my my firing mouse button. Um, and lastly, um, kind of tying everything else was, um, is the idea of interconnected areas. Um, and this is basically just the idea of, I, I don't want to call it like Gygaxian naturalism, even though like some people would, but I, you know, I want this idea of the dungeon let me, let me put it, let me put it in a basic way. Okay. I don't, I want to avoid, like you walk down the hallway and here's a room and it's got a frost giant in it and he's just standing there. And then you walk a little bit down the more down the room and you open up this door and it's got whatever else is a CR nine monster that is appropriate to the challenge, uh, a flame salamander. And then you walk down this hallway and inside this room is a bunch of were rat rogues, right? These are just encounters that have been thrown together in a dungeon. This to me is the number one sin, okay, of random dungeon design, okay? And now obviously great GMs can you know, 
it's so funny because, well, uh, that's a side tangent, but you know, um, is, is, is that you create basically, you don't, you don't do this. You don't have these interconnected areas because it's just randomly being generated. This is why for me personally, I like to, do, I do like random design. It takes me an interesting locate uh, ideas and gives me interesting ideas, but I like to do it as prep because what I can learn then I can learn, okay, this dungeon does have where rats in it. How do I tie them into the dungeon? How do I then tie them into each other? How do I tie them into the other factions? Um, if you go to a, you know, like a site like Donjon, you know, or one of those random dungeon creators and it'll fill your you know dungeon full of encounters, but it just feels like a bunch of random encounters pulled out of the, the monster manual that were CR appropriate. And I find that to be a little bit um, underwhelming and not always the best experience. Now, I was going to say, there are some GMs who are really, really good. These are GMs, by the way, that I think would be really good at running Powered by the Apocalypse games because what they're able to do is take randomness and on the fly incorporate it and make it into something meaningful and awesome. But that is a, a very high skill level of GMing. And a lot of the people who have a hard time with, you know, coming up with stuff for Powered by the Apocalypse would probably be in a similar situation. So to that end, I think that there is a lot of benefit to thinking about your design first because then you can really tie these um, encounters together with the factions, with the history of the dungeon, with the the theme or tones of the dungeon. And that creates a, a more, a better sense of place, right? It's going to make it feel like a more like a living, breathing entity that you can explore. Um, let's see. Um, so I think that's it. I have my notes. Yep. So, you know, again, we've got nonlinear design, exploration being rewarded, environmentally, environmental storytelling, Puzzles, traps, challenges, and other non-combat encounters and interconnected areas. And as a, as a result of this, you're going to end up with a design that emphasizes uh, player agency, immersion, and engagement, right? You're giving the players a ton of choices. You're creating a real environment that will feel lived in and feel real. And the, the, the environment and the place responds to the player's actions. It's going to create a level of engagement because they realize the choices that they're making uh, matter. And I think that all of those things are what really leads to an awesome dungeon. And so as a result, Xandering the Dungeon, the, the style of, of dungeon design inspired by Janelle Jaquez, uh, to me is, is like, you know, it's the bedrock of, of how I think about classic dungeon and site design. Um, all right, so that was, that was the first part that I wanted to, to handle. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna hop over into the chat and, uh, and see what, People have been saying here. Um, doo, 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 doo. Uh, Goodman Games is reprinting Dark Tower as part of their original Adventures Reincarnated line. Oh, very cool. Those uh, original Adventures Reincarnated are really, really cool. I'm really upset because I like didn't buy Lost City, I think, or maybe Isle of Dread. And now I've seen that they're like really expensive. I don't know. Um, Let's see, Shadram says, I'm literally in a meeting earlier about how to gather NPS data from our users or our app. No, don't do it, Shadram. Uh, Kay Steinwind is joining here, but is just catching up. Ben says, it's an excellent reprint. Excellent. Are you saying that Quake 2 is responsible for a whole, ge sorry, generation of dungeon completionists? Um, you know, again, I don't think there's anything, you know, I don't think there's anything wrong with being a dungeon completionist. Um, but I think the very best dungeons always have an extra, you know, there will always be some stone that the players did not leave unturned. Um, dungeon completionist is usually a problem when like, you're like, oh, the plot has to continue. The, the CR appropriate challenges have to be correct. The group is now level four and they're still exploring level one of the dungeon. I should, I should make all the level one monsters level four because I want the players to be challenged. No, no, they are doing what they want to do. If they wanted to go fight harder monsters, they would have they would go down to level two or level three. They already found the entrances. They're choosing not to. 
So, you know, some play people want to complete, some people don't. And I, I mean, that's part of agency, right? Is giving them that option. Um, speaking on dungeon design, did anyone complete dungeon 23 last year? Uh, there's a couple of people who are all over Twitter saying that they did. So, um, you know, I thought that was pretty cool. Actually, I thought it was really cool is, um, uh, Dun uh, dungeon masterpiece, Baron, Baron de Rop. He did on like the, I think on new year's Eve, uh, day, or maybe or like, or maybe a couple days before new year's Eve, he was like, okay, let's do dungeon 23 in a day. And he had a bunch of guests on to raise for charity for, for money for charity. And, uh, they had a bunch of people on and they, just, you know, it was pretty sparse, but they did 365 rooms, uh, of design in one day. So that was pretty cool. Um, the first quake was totally a dungeon crawler with a rocket launcher. And when you think rocket launcher, I think fireball from a wizard. Um, question. Okay. A request. Can you speak to monsters staying in a room and waiting for the PCs to enter and the monsters never leave that room? Um, right. So that's horrible. Um, but again, you have to understand the, the reasoning for that. The reasoning for that is because if we're playing a game that is very, very much concerned about balance and the player's ability. I mean, I mean, let, let's 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 look at a typical thing here. Okay, you want to print a map for a location, but that location has to fit onto your eight and a half by eleven printing margins. Then, because of the way that your game is set up to run. And because of you know all that other stuff, you have to do you have to design your game or you have to design your map at a scale that is one square equals five feet, aka battle grid size. And of course, obviously, you can't make the squares on your map that small. That wouldn't be useful for anybody. So they have to be big enough that people can legitimately see what they're what they're doing. And so what this creates is it means that your design is really limited in how much space and how much areas that you can fill in. This leads to number one small rooms, okay, that are typically uh, jammed together, <laughs> okay? They're, they're all squished into each other. And so you may end up having an encounter in this room and it's, you know, it's only, you know, it's only like 30 by 20 or something like that. So you've got 32 squares um, of, of space and then there's a door here that goes 20 feet to an open room that has more monsters that would totally probably join in because it's, that's the only way you can fit all the encounters that you need to fit onto this map. And so as a result, and then you're playing a game system where if this, you know, if this, you know, you've got a level three party and you know, this is a level four fight, you know, this is, this is a moderate fight and this is a severe fight. If you add that severe fight into that moderate fight, I mean, you're probably going to kill everybody and people are going to complain and they're going to, you know, so they basically have to make the monsters just hang out and chill and sit in the room. You'll see when we go over to caverns of Thracia that, you know, one of the first things uh, that they talk about is, you know, if the group makes their way into uh, you know, this area of the, uh, of the dungeon, then, uh, they, they, they might, they might call, stop, call an alarm or, and as a result, like all, all the, all the monsters, all the members of the cult within like, I don't know, like a five room radius will start pouring into the chamber and take them over, you know, and kill them. So, you know, that style of play has become less popular because people, they just want to, you know, they want to have their balanced encounter and they want to kill the monsters and they don't want to feel like, Oh, now we got to run away and we got to like consider the consequences. Basically, you know, the game is asking them to play combat as war and they don't want to play combat as war. They want to play combat as sport. So, um, now yes, Karima, I mean, that is something that we do. Um, a lot, you know, we took a lot of the, we did that in abomination vaults. We took the, the scale and we just changed it, uh, from five foot grids to 10 foot grids. Uh, and that, that did actually help quite a bit, but, um, you know, there's still a lot of wonkiness, um, about some of the things in pathfinder two about like how often is a monster actually able to hear or, 
or make connection um, in into a thing. I mean, one of the things that I really loved about third edition D and D is very easy. Okay, listen checks in third edition D and D got a minus five to minus ten penalty for doors. Okay, for one door. And of course, the minus five is like standard. Minus 10 is like, you know, a sealed, thick stone door. The person got a minus five if they were distracted. And they also got a minus one per 10 feet of distance. So, and the game told you that the sound of a battle, okay, was DC negative 10, negative 10 negative 10. Okay. But what that means is if I have a goblin, you know, a goblin hangout down the way, I go, okay, well, these goblins have a listen of plus four, but they're distracted minus one. They're about 50 feet away minus six. And there is a wooden door between me and them. So they have a minus 11 to their check. So, you know, pretty much if I roll this, they're going to hear them. On the other hand, if the party uh, is, if there's more doors or the, the distance is further, then suddenly people might end up with like a minus 20 to their listen check. And then they can't, they won't be able to listen to it. Similarly, if the party is quiet or goes out of their way to make things quiet, you might say that the DC is only negative five or zero to hear the battle. And as a result, uh, it's pretty easy to determine whether a monster would hear the party or not and come to it and, and then decide that they're going to come investigate. Anyways, that's something I, I always liked about third edition. Um, Cause it made it really simple. Actually, well, um, it's a side change. We're here to talk about you way. Um, Let's see here. Uh, Solana says the giant cavern in book four of Rise of the Rune Lords had this problem. Everything is jammed together. How do you reasonably do one encounter without triggering eight triggering eight others? I couldn't fathom it. Yeah, um, exactly. Yes. Uh, Wave Echo Caverns from the 5e starter set from Flandover also does the same thing. So, yeah, it, it's, it's a kind of a problem of modern design, which is that everything's kind of squished together. The scale is, is much smaller. Um, and uh, as a result, you know... It, you have to play it with the monster sitting in their room waiting for something to happen to them because otherwise nothing happens. All right. Um, so how is everyone doing? Um, again, if you're, if you're joining us a little late or whatever, uh, we are here tonight talking about the sort of the, the legacy of Janelle Jaquay's in my life. I did not know her personally, sadly, uh, but her design, video game design, her RPG design in particular in the caverns of Thracia was very influential to me and obviously a lot of other people, including Justin Alexander. Um, and as a result, it has kind of shaped the way that kind of what I think of as a good dungeon versus a bad dungeon. So there we go. Um, and as a result, without knowing it, she actually had a tremendous influence on the way that I appreciate D and D and the way that I appreciate dungeons and the, my sort of platonic ideal of what a cool dungeon is, is basically held up to the standards of what she's doing here. Um, one thing I've enjoyed doing is having one D four minus one low level baddies join the fight every round, but see, which is fine, Gid, but you're still thinking about it, right? In terms of balance. I mean, if the creatures next door are three trolls, then they're three trolls and they're going to come in there and whether the party's ready for it or not. Now, part of the design of modern games is to try to avoid that particularly. Um, I mean, I certainly think that what you're describing there is right. Not a, we can't, we don't always get to pick our, choose our battles. The fact of the matter is if you take a moderate encounter and a severe encounter and you stick them together, that is too hard of a fight. Um, and in fact, it's past um, extreme. So, you really can't do that in Pathfinder 2. The math does not support it. So what you're suggesting is a compromise, and I don't think it's a bad one. I think it's reasonable. It's not perfect. It's not what 
I would ideally want in a perfect world, but it works and that's what's important. You know, and it, it gives a it gives you a lot of that sense. And I think that's important. Um is very much a modern design problem, especially with a small five-room dungeon. How can anything else in there not hear the activities? Yeah, exactly. Again, some of this has come out of, again, the modern design, which, as I said, has other concerns like, you know, will this fit in our printing margins? Is it at the scale that people can still use it to be as a battle mat on Foundry VTT? They're not going to draw. They're not going to make three separate maps, right? They're not going to make the map that they put in the book, the map that they put for VTT, the map that they put for the for the printout flip mat. They're not going to do all that, right? They are going to make one map, which is pretty much the battle map, and then also say that is also the dungeon map. And so as a result, the, the it's it, you got to fit in on that five foot scale. Um, so let's, um, let's, let's dig into um, the caverns a little bit. Now, again, this is the third edition sort of remastered or reprinted version of the caverns of Thracia. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, Again, this is what I'm most familiar with, you know, in the intro to the game, uh, into the book, the uh, sort of the, the author, James Kalora, you know, talks about the influence that Jaquay's had on the design. And obviously a lot of the, the maps and all the room descriptions are basically one for one copied from that original version. It was just updated to D20. And again, uh, it's kind of hard to find the original Caverns of Thracia because it was printed on Judges Guild and companies like Drive Through RPG no longer carry Judges Guild products. Um so cool stuff here. Um, let's see here. Uh, RPG Musings. Also, a lot of modern players consider anything more than 10 or 15 rooms to be huge. RPG Musings, you are absolutely correct about that. Um, you know, I, I remember when we were, I, I showed a map from like level one of like one of the mega dungeons that I ran in like in like third edition. And a bunch of people on the Patreon were like, like, what? That is insane. Like, how many rooms is that? I'm like, I don't know, 30 or something, 35. And they're like, that is crazy, you know? Yeah, I mean, so a lot of people, you know, I mean, case of point, I'm not I'm not knocking it too much. But, you know, Abomination Vaults is billed as the mega dungeon. I do not consider it a mega dungeon. <laughs> it is not big enough in my personal definition to be a mega dungeon. Um, I would I would call it a, a dungeon. Um, yeah, Shadram. Yep, combats do take up a larger percentage of the time. You know, we talk about the exploration, of the pillars of play. You've got combat, you've got exploration, you've got role playing, social, flo fluffy bullshit time. And the fact of the matter is, a lot of groups now spend most of their time combating or just kind of, you know, buying stuff in town. It doesn't leave a lot of room for exploring the dungeon. And so if you have a big dungeon worthy of being explored, then it's going to take you a long time to play it. Um, all right. So here we go. Caverns of Thracia. We start off with an introduction. Now to me, again, this is like perfect. You've got 12 pages of history and introduction about this uh, large scale dungeon that you are going to be playing over the next many months of play. So these 13 pages are going to give you the, the, all the background that you need. And you don't have to memorize it, of course. But one of the things that I have personally found as a game master who has run a number of published mega modules or mega adventures is I find this level, this prep to be really, really powerful. And I'll tell you why. Because... When I read the history in a traditional adventure path, number one, a lot of times that information is pointless. It's it has no bearing on the dungeon, the adventure, certainly not the PCs. It's filler. It's filler. It's, it's almost like it's separate content written just so the GM has something to read while they're reading it. It's never going to come up again. Secondly, the fact of the matter is, it's more of a script, okay? It's it's the difference between like studying for a test and the and it could be anything versus memorizing your lines. 
Because when you're playing an adventure path, you're basically saying like, I need to remember, okay, this NPC does this, and then this NPC does that, and then that NPC needs to fly, needs to flee to here because that's 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 where they need to be for the next part of the adventure. So you're you're trying to memorize it. And to me, what I'm doing when I re read these sort of older style games is I am I'm studying it so that while I'm playing, I can make informed rulings and uh, informed decisions when the party decides to go do something that's a little bit off of the rails because they are going to do something off the rails. This makes me a more capable of GM to stay internally consistent. Remember, we talked about that, that level of in, in, interconnectedness is really important. And so if I understand, okay, I, I know what these, I know what these goblins want. So seeing that when the players do something, now that I know the history of these goblins, the players are going way off, they're going way off the rails. They're going, they're doing to something else completely. Then I know how to respond and, and kind of flat back, flash back to that. Um, my old PF2 group got so fast at combat, they took 30 to 45 seconds per player turn. That is pretty damn impressive. Uh, I'm curious what level, and I'm also curious uh, that what kind of like, what kind of classes do they have? I don't know that I could resolve, like physically, I don't know that I physically could resolve a fireball spell in 45 seconds between gathering the dice, rolling the dice, rolling all the saving throws, adjudicating critical fails, fails, successes, critical successes, and updating everybody's hit points. While also the players trying to pick what spot to put their AOE so that it hits almost all the enemies, but none of their PC allies, yada, 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 yada. I, I feel like that alone takes a minute or two. So I'd be curious to know <laughs> what, what were the circumstances that you were talking about here. Um, Paizo letting us know about the magic stove that cleanses smoke in the kitchen. Yeah. And you know, the other thing too, Jackal Torn Moves, that's fine. You could put something in there, but I don't need to know why. And I don't need to know the history of it. Like it, you'll see this a lot. There's, there's weird stuff. I don't remember exactly what the term, the first edition Dungeon Master's Guide uses, but a lot of dungeons had some, just weird shit in there, you know? Um, and a lot of times that it didn't even offer an explanation. It would just say the stove in the corner magically turns smoke into a, a, a perfume smelling aroma. And you're like, okay, why? What is this? And it's like, no, nothing. It's just random. It's just, you know, kind of like just to make it interesting or funny, but it doesn't go into like the full detail of it. Um, let's see. Great to see streams back. Appreciate you, Derek. Uh, Gabe, I don't, I don't think I went anywhere, buddy. I think I've been here. Uh, I streamed five times during the holiday week between Christmas and New Year's, and then I was right back at it with uh, two streams a week, Tuesday and Thursday, and I did a bonus stream on Sunday. So, um, you know, I mean, I did take a, uh, I did take a, a, a little vacation at the beginning of December. I think I missed a stream, but I still went live from Vegas. So, um, all right. So, so before we get into this, uh, and again. Spoiler for Caverns of Thracia, if you've never played it before. That being said, it's so big and complicated, I don't really think it's going to like ruin the experience if for some reason ever you're going to play it. Plus, most people here are GMs. So we can see here that we have uh, a bunch of chapters, and each chapter roughly equivalates to a level of the dungeon. So we have the Lost City of Thracia, and, and we'll talk about this in a minute, but that's like the you know, the, the surface level, right? The, the ancient crumbling cities. And then we have the first level, uh, temples of Thanatos, not Thanos, Thanatos. Um, again, it's when this was originally written in the seventies, there were still a lot of uh, influences from like Greek mythology and all this other stuff in um, RPGs. And Thanatos is like, means death or God of death or whatever in Greek so I think that, you know, that, that's what, that's the origin of it. This is supposed to be the Thanatos is the, the God of death. Um, so, uh, but you know, the, the games back then when they were made in the seventies, you know, they didn't necessarily all, you know, they didn't use the forgotten realms pantheon because forgotten realms pantheon didn't exist. Um, okay. Still Greek God of death. And it still means death in modern Greek. Good to know. Okay. Um, so let's just kind of quickly take a look. I'm going to scroll down to the bottom. Let's take a look at the maps and, 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 you know, we'll pay, we'll pay a little bit more attention to them, but, um, so this is the sort of the 
lost city of Thracia. And you can see it's it's hemmed in by a, a, a very, very foreboding series of limestone cliffs lost deep into the jungle wastelands um, at the edge of a vast marshy swampland and bogland. And so, you know, the you can imagine here like, a, you know, an ancient uh, Mayan city uh, or or if. If, if, but with Greek influences, right, uh, abandoned to the jungle and, you know, columns and colonnades have collapsed. But there's the ruins and rubble of this city uh, that we can see throughout here. And we'll get into the details of this. But, you know, one square equals 100 feet on this scale. So, you know, we're talking about a pretty big area here in terms of the space. And there's a bunch of locations to go to. We don't have to go to any of them. I mean, uh, we have to go to at least one of them so we can start going through the dungeon. But we'll get into some of the detail of this uh, in a minute. So the way that this, uh, I'm going to skip, I'm going to skip ahead here. So this is our level one map of the caverns of Thracia. And we can see here that this, it's not overly huge. It's not incredibly, it's not like some, 155 encounters rooms, but we can see that there's roughly 27 keyed encounters and rooms on this level. And we can also see that there's a number of secret doors and that there's a number of different passages. There's a number of different entrances and exits to this dungeon and from this dungeon. And as a result, when you think about, well, what am I supposed to do in this dungeon? The answer is, Whatever you want, you're supposed to explore it and be rewarded for exploring it. And so that to me is really, really, really awesome. Um, and we can even see that there's, you know, again, the scale here, we're not used to this, one square equals 10 feet. So that means that these hallways are 10 feet wide. And it means that this opening room that we enter into is 50 feet by 50 feet. So that's 10 squares by 10 squares in Pathfinder 2 language. Even this pillared hall is 10, 5, 10, 20, 30 feet wide. So this is a very wide space uh, compared to what the kind of tight, cramped corridors that we're used to. You know, the only time that you really see a five foot wide corridor is for things like this small little secret passageway here that quickly shoots 30 feet down into room nine. And I think that we can all agree that that feels appropriate, right? like this small little hidden uh, a access or exit chamber. And as a result, that makes sense that that is five feet wide, but everything else is 10 feet wide. Um, this also works really well because, you know, in the, in the old school D&D &D games, like you could have three human sized characters that could, that could march abreast. And so when you have a five foot wide corridor, it creates this weird problem where like there's only one person in the front. Five foot, five, five foot wide corridors are really truly the worst. So we're going to go through some more of these maps. Here's level two of the dungeon. And we can see that it has more of this sort of cavernous area. Again, look how, look how different all of these areas are. Look at how there are so many different ways. Like to, to, you can go, you can get to level two from this passage. You can get to level two from this passage. So we can see here from 17 and over to eight. So if we go back up to level one, this means that if we start here in room one and we make our way through the dungeon, okay, let's say we find this secret passageway, we come through here, we make our way down, we make our way into this way, we find this vast cave, okay, um, and we go, we're standing here, right, we're standing here, and we see that there is this bridge over this chasm. So we know it goes somewhere because that's got to be awesome. But there's no way that we can reach it from here. But now we know that this exists and we kind of want to know, like, what's on the other side of this chasm? So we so we we persevere and we go, OK, so we're going to backtrack and we're going to go back up this way and we're going to come over to here and we're going to go here. It's like, OK, well, now I want to get over to this area of the of the dungeon. And we might come up through here and find this secret door or spoiler alert, you can actually take a rope from the surface and come down into one of these open areas. And now we're here and we make our way over and we cross the bridge and then we fight, we go into room 616 and then we go down and now we're on to level two. Or 
That's, I mean, think about that. Think about what I just described. Oh, did you go to the, did you find the secret door to the, to the, the library with the pentagram room? And then you found the secret, the chasm, and then you made your way back over the dungeon. And then you went up to the top and then you took the rope down off of the pillar to come down into the great chasm and then fight your way to the rope bridge and then cross over and then go down the stairs. And then somebody goes, no, man, we were in room one. We left. We went a couple different twists and turns. We went down passageway eight, which led to level two. I didn't encounter anything. <laughs> so you could just walk to level two. You could just casually stroll there. I mean, you know, there's there's a couple of things down this hallway here that we'll get to. But more or less, you can, the way to access level two is, it, it, there's so many different ways to get there. Um, and as a result, uh, you know, and I, I should point out, that's getting down to level two. What about getting to level one itself? Well, guess what? There's actually like three different ways to enter this level. You can enter here through the big, obviously huge, big staircases that say up, right? The obvious entrance. But there's also this entrance here, 18, which goes up. It goes to a secret uh, hidden entrance to the dungeon. And then, as I said before, you can also, you know, take the, the, the plunge and you can use a rope and descend from the surface down a, a vast open sinkhole that is opened and make your way down into the dungeon that way. So it, it it's so non-linear. And by the way, think about it this way. As a dungeon master, how do you even balance this? Like, I don't know what level the party's going to be when they get somewhere. I don't know how many resources or hit points they are going to have. They might have just walked straight from level one down to level two and then they, you know, they miss this secret door. They walk down here and boom, we're suddenly in encounter 39. And it's like, okay, well, you guys are still level one. I'm not going to change. Like this is, this is where you're already on level two of the dungeon and you're in room 39. Like shit, shit's going to get real. I don't know what to describe, how to describe it to you. So it, it's a very different level of play because I should kind of go back to the whole thing about Xandering the dungeon and Janelle Ojeque. Exploration is rewarded. And sometimes exploration is punished in the sense that, you know, if you're not careful, you can get, you know, screwed over. You need to be, you know, care, you need to be on your wits. You have to have your wits about you. Uh, roll for combat cannot be snarky tonight. I've never, I never actually, I actually never saw this dungeon before. Oh, sweet. Um, so uh, level three is a vast ancient city that is located deep beneath the ancient sea. Basically the city was ruined and the people abandoned it. And then they went down into the depths and they like founded a new society and it's all twisted and evil. You know how it goes. Um, and again, more caverns, more rooms. We're now up to room number 77. Oh, nope. Sorry. Room number 82. And the last couple of levels are just small sub levels. I'm a big fan of sub levels because they allow you to, um, tell a quick story and a quick theme in a dungeon. And then finally, level four, the final level of the dungeon. This is probably our most complex dungeon with a lot of different sweeps and twists and turns and a lot of different options and secret doors. But a party would not be, party would not be wanting for lack of choices on this room. There are so many different ways you can go. Look at this map and tell me where the boss fight is. I, you don't know. I have no idea. How could you know anything? You know, you don't. Now, entropy, I do agree with you. Non-linear means more work for the GM. You got to be prepared for anything or have the story beats not dependent on location. Entropy, I, I actually do agree with you. That being said, level four of the Caverns of Thracia is not something that you are going to have to prepare for a very, very long time. If you make sure that you're somewhat comfortable with, you know, uh, the number of the buildings here in the city and most of level one, you are probably well on your way to running many sessions worth of, uh, of gaming with maybe just a quick couple of refreshes of the most commonly, you know, the most likely to run. You know, you'll, you learn your group. There's nothing wrong with going, I'm pretty confident that my group is going to go this way. And there's also nothing wrong with asking them at the end of the session or maybe in between sessions, hey, we got a game coming up. Uh, did you guys ever decide which way you wanted to go? Were you guys going to try to make your way back over to the chasm or were you going to just going to take the stairs down to level two? Just, just let me know. And I think that's totally fine. And then you can just, you know, as long as you stay three to five, you know, encounters uh, ahead of the party, 
then you're usually going to be pretty, pretty good. Um, so you can literally stroll from the entrance down one corridor to level two if you don't find any secret doors. Careful exploration and mapping allows for good choices. Just shrugging and going down the stairs is questionable. Exactly. That's why I'm saying that exploration, I use the term in quotations, can be punished. But um, okay, so let's go back here. So chapter one, introduction. This is talking about the history of the caverns of Thracia. And again, this is like what I was talking about before about the, the layers of onions, right? So you have the era, and again, this is a, a some of the language is um, you know, a little bit like uh campy, because again, it's it's from a it's from a time and a place when um you know RPGs weren't as you know, they were they were newer. So uh you have the era of the reptilians. Okay. Long before the warrior king Balskonar discovered the calendar obelisk in the twilight of the uttermost war, you had the reptilians. So originally the caverns were, you know, populated by the reptilians. And then we have, you know, a couple pages of lore about them. But this isn't just meaningless lore. In a way, you're reading this, but your group is going to learn this by exploring the dungeon. Not all of it but a lot of it. And they're going to learn it through bits and pieces, not through exposition dumps. They're going to learn this through the very DNA of the structure. And you might say, okay, so what? Well, a couple of things. Number one, sometimes knowledge is power and knowing how something works or knowing more information will be an advantage to maybe an encounter or a, a combat as war encounter. But also, it, and it depends on your type of players, but you know, this is definitely... Uh, something that I have seen in, in my players over the years, I, I think a lot of players enjoy that feeling of learning more about the world around them. And, you know, it's, it's I think, knowing that, oh, there, there's a reason for this, and I, I want to learn it. I've even gone so far as before as to having a dungeon, okay, and I have, like, key pieces of lore that uh, that the dungeon has. Like maybe there's like 40 pieces of lore that basically tell the story of the dungeon. And I will even sometimes give each of those pieces of lore an XP value. So something that is like a deep, dark secret, like, um, you know, Queen Alessia never actually died. She turned into a lich and she still is awaiting resurrection in the bottom of the dungeon. That might be like really secret lore. That might be worth, you know, 10,000 experience points. But, you know, the fact that the, the orcs were hired by the, you know, Duke so-and-so to bring chaos to the realm, that might not be as big of a secret. And so maybe that's only worth 500 experience points because I kind of expect that the, the party is probably going to discover that earlier on. And when the party does discover these bits of lore, I kind of go, yeah, awesome. You've learned more about the world. Here's 500 experience points or here's a thousand experience points. Now, why would I do that? What gets rewarded gets repeated. I want my groups to be curious. I want my groups to try to be you know, uh, figuring stuff out and putting two and two together and making connections and paying attention. So I reward that with experience points and hopefully they enjoy it as well. But I always found that to be very, very effective. Uh, that's not specifically from this module, but all right. Um, so then we have the area, the era of the Thracians and, and then we get to the outline of the adventure. So, um, so I'll let the words of the author speak for themselves here. Uh, this chapter describes the history of the caverns of Thracia. The purpose of this history is to breathe life into the caverns and the adventure. It's a tool to create a balanced and exciting gaming experience. The judge should use it to provide better descriptions for encounters and as an imaginative aid to form connections between them. In this way, the history can be used to provide a remarkable backdrop for the adventure. For example... When the PCs join battle with four gnolls in a temple, careful prior examination of their encounters may allow them to realize that they are fighting the bloodthirsty descendants of the former slaves of the lost Thracian civilization. Not only does this kind of understanding add detail and drama to the encounters, but also in many situations, it provides valuable in-game clues for their successful resolution. So this is everything that we were talking about before. The idea that having these details here, sure, it makes it feel more real and it makes it feel more lived in. 
but it can also be a very powerful game aid. It can be something that makes the party feel rewarded for paying attention and give advantages, you know, in a kind of combat as war sense. This isn't going to be like, and you got a plus one to your attack rolls, but it could be something that the PCs use and using the knowledge that you gained in the dungeon to beat the dungeon. That's pretty sweet. All right. Um, so let's go over here. Um, so again, you know, nothing here that, uh, should, should take any of us by surprise. Um, you know, they, they give you a couple of easy hooks. Uh, this is written, you know, as written for third edition D&D. &D, this is written for third to eighth level characters. Let's see if it says anything extra detail here. For four to six characters of levels three to eight. So take that for whatever it means. You could have, you could have six characters that are like level four, or you could have four characters that are level three. Um, and I'll read the back blurb here because it's pretty cool. For over a thousand years, the things that lurk beneath the waters skulk in the darkness and lie hungrily in dank crypts have been patient. While all around them, men and monsters bicker amongst themselves, bold enough to traverse the dark cavern's depths, but afraid or perhaps wise enough to leave the forgotten vaults and hidden passages alone. And still they wait undisturbed. They are waiting for you. Beneath the lost ruins of ancient Thracia lie the vast caverns of a once great civilization. While a death cult rules the surface, the Minotaur King and his beast men lurk far below. Descend even deeper into the darkness and discover a lost and arcane world that waits for those brave enough to enter. So that's the adventure. It is not save the town. It is not get to the next step in the adventure path. It's just this awesome ancient place full of danger treasure and excitement and that is that is that's pretty cool to me um but again talking about really you know amazing design and again things that really influence the a lot of the advice that i give on this table um it talks about factions right on you know getting back to what uh, gid was saying earlier unlike a static adventure where nothing happens until the pcs open the door the caverns of Thracia are dynamic. Within their depths, several factions, each with their own goals and values, vie for supremacy. Again, I wasn't kidding when I said that a lot of the advice I give in nightlife is taken and inspired by this module and by this approach to, to, to game design. So again, you know, to say to say that uh, Janelle Jaquez was an influence on my GMing style is an understatement. Um, within the depths, several factions, each with their own goals and values, vie for supremacy. How this struggle plays out in the adventure is up to you, the judge. It may be that all the different factions regard the PCs as their implacable enemies, or it may be that a cunning politician can play them off against one another. One of my favorite things is when the PCs play the bad guys off of each other. Even if they are all enemies of the PCs, however, they are all enemies of each other as well, which may make for some spectacular three-way battles depending on how your players handle a challenge. And then this uh, section provides some of the examples of factions. So again, this is doing so much more than making this just a place to go in and fight monsters and get treasure. It is it is a living, breathing place, but one in which the players can use their information to make better decisions. Um, we also get a cool rumor chart, which I love rumor charts, things that you might know before the adventure begins, a bit, maybe something that brought you to this place. Um, so we got all these different factions within the dungeon. And there we go. Um see here the caverns of thracia present many challenges for players but it also provides challenges for you the judge the information presented in this book can provide material for many forays into the depths conceivably an entire campaign could be designed around the caverns following the pc's path to eventually conquesting the entire area the palace on level three might make an ideal base for a powerful adventuring party if they can take it from those who now possess it there should be ample opportunities to garner experience for level advancement within. There are also opportunities for the good of heart, as the Death Walkers are in desperate need of saving, both from the Beastmen and their Dark God. More powerful adventurers may even risk tracking down the immortal king in the sanctuary of the sun and moon, although there is great risk involved in doing so. 
There are also many opportunities to garner wealth, research history, and activate and wield fabulous arcane energies herein. If you know what motivates your players and their characters, you can tailor the adventure accordingly. And with proper preparation, you should find it rewarding for all concerned. I love the pros there. Um, so again, this is, um, I don't know, this is hearkening back to a, a style that for me is just like the heart of adventure. And, 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 it's, and it's a really a tool box to make this and your groups your own. Remember what I was saying before about like Sunless Citadel, how I've played it many times. And it's always kind of played out the same way. I bet the thing, the same thing is true for something like Rise of the Rune Lords or Extinction Curse or uh, any of those, you know, modern APs, um, fifth editions, uh, you know, Tyranny of Dragons or whatever it's called. A Horde of the, Horde of the D Dragon Queen or something. I can't remember the name of it. My point is a lot of times it probably plays out pretty similar. But, you know, this here is just even saying, like, they might not even go fight the immortal king in the sanctuary, the sun and moon. Your group might never get down that far. They might go to someplace else. They might say it's not worth it. They might get killed. They might try something different. There's nothing that is holding a gun to their head and saying you have to go through this adventure. Um, they're only there because they want to be. Um, okay. Uh, let me catch up on chat real quick. Uh, is often I ask my players, so which way are you going next session? My players totally understand that I need to prep and plan. And I think that is more than reasonable. We aren't, you know, we're not AI machines yet. You know, Is the remasters from Goodman worth it? If any, is anyone picking up their version of Dark Tower? I personally think I own. So I own the, the keep on the Borderlands and I bought this two volume set of the Temple of Elemental Evil. Um, and I, I, I just love them. I think they're great. They include all the original modules and then they have a completely updated fifth edition version of the module. I think it's really great stuff, but I was saying, I think they're really expensive now. I don't, uh, maybe some of the, they had really limited print runs or maybe just when I saw them, they were really expensive, but I wanted to get some other ones, but I have not yet. Um, uh, Ryan says, yeah, I'll be honest. Some of my favorite stuff from your Rune Lord game where you just flat out gave history over the table. Stuff that's buried in GM's tip but doesn't come out much. I'm okay knowing more. Yeah, uh, I did that all the time. I was like, because I was like, look, this is fun, interesting history, but the, the adventure gave you no way to learn this. So that's why I said that this history, that these these kind of modules that, uh, that Janelle created matter is because there actually is a way for the players to learn this and it's not like they have to learn it so that they can go to the next part of the adventure because that's again that's a railroad this is advent this is knowledge for knowledge's sake which is really really cool um i'm running curse of the crimson crown with two groups i usually have to prepare for three to four options it is delight to see how murder hobo the veterans are versus the comedic options that the youthful group take <laughs> Um, yes, um, <laughs> dungeon ecology, who knew, who knew my points in myconology would co count for anything? My myconology, um, the bad guys hate each other is a good way to avoid the whole aggro, the entire dungeon problem. Very true. They're not, uh, they're not coming because they don't actually care if the goblins next door are dying. And if you go back Karama, to my night life series with Bob, I talk about the importance in a dungeon of creating neutral zones or, you know, sort of, um, no man's lands or buffer zones or buffer chambers or buffer rooms, because there's definitely going to be an area, especially when a, a creature or a, a set of creatures are sort of tribal, uh, or, or form communities that, you know, if you're in room three, then, you know, the goblins in room four and the goblins in room five are potentially going to come and fight with you. But it's very unlikely that the goblins would ever be right next to you know, their, their enemies, the kobolds, you need some buffer space between them. You need that sort of no man's land. And that's really important because it, it, it's like a, it's like a windbreak and it prevents, like you said, the entire dungeon from aggroing. And it also kind of gives you a cool, weird respite. Like if you're in the neutral zone, you're not in the goblin area, you're not in the cobalt area, you're not in the undead area, but you're kind of out in the, out in the neutral zone in the wilds. And that might be where, there are scary monsters that aren't part of those tribal groups 
that you might encounter, say, through a random encounter role. But you're not going to, like, encounter the kind of uh, organized resistance that you might get in some of those other areas. And again, all that does is, is create more texture and more detail to the, uh, to the whole experience. Um, sweet. Okay. Sweet. Kickstarter and the OG one. Oh, okay. And hoping it, all right. Has not, has not shipped yet. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I could get the BX version included in the five E book. I've seen these at my LGS and the five E is a turnoff. Yeah. So, um, it has the original, I don't know where my where is my keep on the borderlands uh, it's a gigantic pink book i don't know how i can't find it on my shelf um so like yeah it it it, it contains the original pdf or the original module inside of it as well which to be fair i mean i think they did a good job with the 5e update and it's pretty you know it's pretty faithful to it um there's no PDFs of those Goodman reprints. Interesting. Okay. Um, ah, RPG musings with the good information. Okay. All right. Um, so let's just kind of, let's kind of like, just let's dig into the, um, let's dig into the, let's dig into the caverns here. The city. There we go. So this is our city. Um, the lost city of Thracia. Nestled between a large swamp and two sheer cliffs. So we got some information here about the, the you know the bugs and the monsters that live around it and you know how likely it are that you were gonna die of heat exhaustion from coming here. Again, some cool art. And we get to the we get to the map. So the first thing is location A, main entrance to the caverns, right? So boom, right there in the middle of uh, of our city. The Thracians built a large edifice for Zeus, their chief god. During construction, they discovered the caverns. Now, note, this is a uh, EL6. So, you know, we're starting off the adventure with, you know, potentially fighting, you know, if you're level three party, uh, you're supposed to be fighting EL3s <laughs> and EL4s. So this is an EL6. Um, and it's because the beastmen have stationed a patrol of six gnolls here. But they are actually skirmishing with another faction which controls the top part of it which is the death the death walkers um notice this L look look at even at the detail here the gnolls wait in the trees surrounding the pedestal approximately 15 feet above the ground using their height as an advantage the gnolls wait for an opportune moment to ambush with their short bows the gnolls are experienced warriors and try to eliminate those with ranged weapons or likely magical abilities first. It is entirely possible that this is the first encounter of this adventure that you experience because the group goes, okay, we're trying to make our way to the temple of Zeus. We, we've heard a rumor that the entrance into the caverns of Thracia is located in the ruined temple. And, you know, sure enough, you can see here, the murals left in the interior depict the great God Zeus casting lightning bolts, there's a 20 foot wide marble, uh, 20 foot wide marble stairs that descend to le level one, room one, right? Which is what we were seeing earlier um, when we were looking at the maps. But this is this is just so crazy, <laughs> right? Like this is, I mean, it's it's literally telling you that these guys are set up to to ambush and uh, just to destroy a party. Again, is that bad? Well, it depends on what you want out of a game. Um, if the group just walks in there, you know, boom. Um, yes, HP per monster. And by the way, this is the type of thing that I, I, you know, if a player asks, I'll be like, you know, you don't have to tell them there's one with low hit points. Describe how one is scrawny or one is, um, you know, already injured. Maybe, again, environmental storytelling. Maybe one's injured and it looks like it, the, the wound was caused by a stone axe or stone blade or or you find a shard of obsidian tipped arrow embedded in the knoll's shoulder and then this is like after the fight but they notice that you know they fight the one knoll they hit it once it dies they go oh this thing was already hurt well what hurt it and then they see this like primitive arrow and they start thinking oh maybe there's something else here something else with these kind of weapons and you know there are something else with those here there's something else with those kind of weapons um and that's that's the death walkers so it, it, it's, again, a great way of sort of environmental storytelling. Um, 
It's the best. <laughs> it's best that it's a first encounter. Wipe the party to set the theme of the campaign before people are overly attached to the characters. To be clear, I don't think this would actually wipe your party. But again, it's not like you're you're and this isn't made for level one characters. So you know, presumably you've been playing for a little bit. But it, it is setting the tone, right? That hey, uh, the, the creatures here aren't just here so that you can, you know, harvest them for XP. Um, they have their own issues. So. Uh, building A has an some combat encounter, but it also has the stairs. But also I should note that if we look here, um, the uh, the Knolls, you might be just trying to get into the dungeon. So maybe you sneak in. You don't have to fight these Knolls, right? The Knolls are in the trees surrounding the pedestal. If maybe you wait till nighttime or maybe they observe the gnolls and they learn when the gnolls, you know, quit their their guard duty for the day and they sneak into the dungeon without ever fighting these gnolls, that's okay too. Now, this is a third edition module. So it has the problem that monsters are worth experience points and treasure is not. But I should point out that if you're playing old school D&D, &D, which is when Caverns of Thracia was originally written, uh, treasure was worth experience points. Monsters were, were very were, were worth almost nothing. They were worth they were worth experience points, but not for the risk of li life and limb that you took by fighting them. So again, we have an entrance into the dungeon in in, uh, in building A, but in addition, we've got building B. This is a short squat building scorched by fire, and this is the headquarters. We can see building B is located on the kind of uh, the opposite side of this canal or this river from uh, from building A. And building B is the home of a, another faction, the Death Walkers, okay? Sort of a um sort of a tribal people that inhabit here um and sort of worship the god of death, Thanatos. But notice it provides an entry to level 1 of the dungeon, room 18. So if we go to location A, we're going to fight gnolls with short bows, uh, you know, ambushing us from the trees, and then we're going to enter the dungeon in location one. If we go to location B, we potentially might fight a band of six death walkers. And if we do, or we otherwise get through them or sneak through them, and they're a little bit easier to potentially negotiate with than the gnolls are, um, we could enter the dungeon at room 18, a completely different set part of the dungeon. So this is like already showing you how non-linear this game is because I don't know where my party is going to go. I don't know what my party is going to do. Um, and so they might fight the Death Walkers. Uh, they might not. And, you know, that is, I think, really, really, really awesome. Um. And again, they're going to learn about the gnolls. They're going to learn about uh, the Death Walkers from each other. So again, already we, we've got two ways into the dungeon, two different types of encounters, location A and location B. Um, then what about location C? So that's located near location A. This, is, this used to be an old Bacchanalian hostel, all right? Once a repository for Thracian wines and liquors. Again, you can see the sort of Greek influence here. You know, check for a wandering monster roll. There's a tablet in Dwarf. The tablet states that the writer found the location of a secret entrance. The building is described as a squat dark building made of dark, dark stone. This is the, the entrance to the dungeon from location B. So location B is sort of a secret entrance into the dungeon. Here is environmental storytelling. Here is rewarding exploration. If a group goes to location C, they might have an encounter. They might not. It's random. There's no keyed encounter here. So is it worthless? No, because they might find this ancient tablet written in Dwarven that lets them know that there's another entrance into the dungeon that maybe they want to consider. And you're like, okay, well, but don't they have to find that? No, they don't have to find that. They can just go in through location A. So this is a, re a reward for looking around. And again, we're just on the, the top levels here of the ruins. Um, I'm not going to go through every single building here, but needless to say, there are several different groups and factions spread out around this massive city area. And they're all far enough apart that, you know, you're, you're going to kind of be having a series of encounters. This is before you ever enter into the dungeon. And I think that that is really, really, really awesome. 
Um, let me see if I can find Corey. One of these descriptions describes how you can take the rope down. Here we go. Location F, which is near one of the rubbled ruins. Hole in the ground. This is a five foot diameter hole that drops 65 feet down into level one, room 23. Anyone falling down this takes 66 damage. Climbing down the hole is not extraordinarily difficult, however, and there's even a ruined column near the hole to which you might successfully attach a rope. So now we have three ways from just these upper level ruins of getting down into the dungeon. We can go through the knolls and take the main entrance to the Temple of Zeus, or we can go through the Death Walkers and try to either fight our way or negotiate our way past them into the secret Temple of Thanatos, which leads us into the bottom of the level at Room 18, or we could just take a nondescript hole into the ground, throw a rope into the depths, toss a torch down, and start descending. And boy, doesn't that sound awesome. And again, this is all part of that non-linear experience which I think is so important. Um, and that's not even the dungeon. That was just the upper level. Um, so let's go to level one. All right, so here we have level one. This is um, there we go. Okay, so this is level one, the Temple of Thanatos. Uh, real quick, let's see here. Um, I enumerate HP for my games. Wounded, broken, 50%, bloodied, shattered, 75%, and then fudged the last few for dramatic effect. Let the bard tell a killing blow every once in a while. Entropy Nomad, um, I do the complete opposite. I have my players track my monster's HP. I tell the P I tell the PCs, okay, that ogre has 29 hit points. That ogre has 36 hit points. Uh, Bob, you track them. And then Bob writes down on a scratch sheet of paper or whatever, a notebook, 29, 36. And then they, they track the HP for them. I don't even have to re record it. Less work for me, the GM. And that way the players know exactly what's up. Um, so I, uh, I, I, anything I can do to make my life easier and also avoid any sense of fudging is my style of game mastery. I'm glad that works for you and your group, but uh, that is definitely not definitely not what I do. Uh, I made it. Hi, Derek. I know you missed me. Yes, Mike, I did. And and your many multiple thousands of dollars of of uh, uh, whatever whatever that was that ridiculous thing that you posted today. Um. Hello, Boothby. All right, um, so we have the upper level. And again, a little bit of a history, uh, you know, from the, about the level and, you know, how the, you know, again, how the level itself is affecting the dungeon, you know, the, uh, let's see here, the discovery of the oracular skull in room 12 would be considered a holy sign to the death walkers that the time to strike against the beast men has come. This leads to a possible plot whereby the PCs use this discovery to rally the Death Walkers to their aids, although doing so and thereby placating Thanatos could potentially be evil. So again, this is just talking about like, hey, the party doesn't have to discover the oracular skull and the Death Walkers do not have to take it as a holy sign if the PCs were to find it and bring it to them that at the time to strike against the Beastmen has come. But they could. So again, this is what this is what I talk about situations, not plots. And you can see sort of the the awesomeness of the the style and the way that Janelle crafted adventures is, you know, and again, this is a remake, but it's originally an uh, an adventure from the, you know, early seven uh, late 70s. This was different. You know, this is a different way of doing the adventures that had been done. It it, it was more complex, it was more had more interesting things going on. You know, there's a lot of early classic D and D adventures, which I love, but they're pretty basic. You know, I love. You know, if you go to if you look at B one in uh, what is it, into the unknown or whatever it's called, it that dungeon is bad. That dungeon, you know, that dungeon is so bad. Um, Quest Questeron or whatever, Quake Questeron. Even you know, I love Keep on the Borderlands, but the Caves of Chaos are pretty simplistic. This this was something different. This was something more mature. Um, all right, um. 
So we got our entry hall. That's level. That's room one, right up here in the uh, in the middle of the map. Assuming we came through the Temple of Zeus and we fought our way past the knolls, or otherwise made our way past the knolls. We got a big room here. Now note, there's no descriptive text given. Um, it's not like it's full of you know things. There's information, but there's nothing that basically says GM, you must read this. I personally hate boxed text. I prefer, I feel very comfortable, uh, you know, talking and describing what the party is. I personally, the reason I don't like box text is because box text to me reminds me of cutscenes in video games. I hate cutscenes in video games. I don't get to play. This is lame. I don't care what's happening on the screen. I came here to push buttons. I prefer to give very simplistic descriptions and then let the players ask for more details. I, I like to quickly, as quickly as possible, get the ball back into the player's hands so that they can take, you know, agency. Now, of course, if you play with people who are used to, you know, uh, uh, limited and bad descriptions, when you say, you know, you give your very brief one or two sentences description, they might think, oh, so that's all there is to see here. Okay, we move on. But I'm playing with people who I've played with for a long time and who are very good players, people like Smith, who will ask questions. Well, tell me more about the desk or tell me more about the pile of bat guano. And that's when I can give more detail, but that way it's not just me monologuing for, you know, two paragraphs of text. Also just a personal pet peeve too. A lot of times I will do the opposite. <laughs> I will do the opposite of what a lot of adventure text does, right? Where the adventure text will be like, you see before you a elegant temple made of or red sandstone shot through with veins of some silvery mineral. The floor undulates as if a thousands of feet had crossed over the threshold over many, many, many millennia. Ancient pillars carved in bas relief stretched from floor to ceiling, eight in total, four on either side of the massive hallway. At the far end, a golden alt altar shaped in the image of a young woman stretches up from the, and you know, you're just going on and then you're like, oh, also there's two ogres attacking you. I, that drives me crazy <laughs> when there are, <laughs> especially like when it's not in the box text, it's like in the description of the encounter afterwards. I can't stand it when, when there's a monster in the room or, or, you know, whatever attacking the party. I usually give a really brief description because you don't have time. I, you know, I might in that same description, I might say, you know, you enter into a large ancient temple filled with large pillars, but your eyes are immediately drawn to the two ogres that are charging forward from the darkness. And I don't describe the rest of it because you know what you, the player had tunnel vision. The PC had tunnel vision because the two ogres are coming at them. They, they don't have time to study the bas relief or the texture of the mineral veins in the floor. They can look at that shit later, but right now ogres are charging them. So can we deal with that, please? Um, and uh, and do I describe uh, do I describe the rest of the room once they're dealt with? No, I go, you know, I, I'll you know, you can even lead the questions to the players. You know, uh, the ogres are slain. What would you like to do now? Okay, is there? Would you like to, you know? You could say what do you want to do, or you could say, is there anything you want to look at, or is there anything that you want to explore more? And as the group moves around, you could just sort of. Put yourself in their place. What would they see now? What would they notice now? I'm not talking about perception checks. I'm talking about descriptions. I'm talking about allowing the player's actions and the player's activity to guide how they see and experience the game. That being said, I don't try to hide anything, you know, as much as I can from my players. You know, you have this incredible, as a game master, you have this incredible insight into the world. You know everything and you can make anything happen. So you have this perfect omniscient knowledge in a way. It's difficult. I mean, you gotta put yourself on the other side of the screen sometimes. The players are looking at your world and this situation through a very small window. The last thing that you wanna do, right, is dirty that window up or, you know, or, or, or allow it to get frosty. You want to keep that window as clear as you can. There's not, you'll never be able, I mean, sometimes you can make the window bigger, but long story short, you know, the, it, the, the communication back and forth between player and GM is not the most efficient thing. 
So it's already a strained process. The last thing you need to do is try to like, you know, hide stuffing back. I've had experiences where I've like flat out basically told the players there's something here and they still missed it. So you, you really can't be too obvious about it. Um, if you describe too much, then you lead them down to gazebo moments. They expect a reward for destroying perfectly good lumber. Um, and, and again, I think that my group has learned from that and they, they really like to, you know, chew on the scenery, if you will. Um, okay. So let's, again, going back to the Xandering, the dungeon. So we've got the entry hall. It's 20 foot wide marble stairs enters into the room a uh, room one. The walls were once painted in bright color, now faded. The scenes of elaborate ceremonies involving burning calves and other sacrifices to the gods. The room stinks of bat guano. There is almost six inches of the gray dung on the floor. Tracks crisscross the fecal matter, leading from rooms two to rooms four and five. There are also tracks to room 9A. Again, information, learning about the dungeon, what's going in, what's going out. What kind of tracks? What kind of information? Oh, there's must be, this is not as abandoned as we thought we were. Um, hanging on the ceiling 30 feet above are 150 bats. Smoky torches, directional light shined on them, or even magical light irritates the bats. If irritated, they swarm, reducing visibility to five feet, and due to this noise, immediately check for a wandering monster. Now, this is kind of an example of what I was talking about, about sometimes you punish exploration. And I don't mean punish, but it just makes the players feel like, hey, that's cool. I shined my lantern. You know, we saw the, it's, it, it's, it's, it's foreshadowing. It's, it's building it up. When you describe the thick layer, it, you think about it in a movie, right? When you think about that term cinematic from Matt Colville, you can imagine the movie where the players enter and they're seeing, looking around and they realize they're standing in, you know, almost a half a foot of dung. And then the one player, you know, the one character takes their flashlight, you know, or their hooded lantern or their bullseye lantern, and they slowly raise it to the ceiling, right? And you, like, know what's going to be there. And then when it's full of bats, you feel rewarded. And then when they start swarming because of the light disturbing them, you go, oh, yeah, of course that's what they would do. And then suddenly the bats are swarming around you. Then you're rolling the random encounter, and the players are like, wow, this this just feels so dynamic. This just feels so lived in. And and so unexpected. He didn't know that we were going to shine a light on the bats. No, I didn't. But you had, took an action and had an act, you know, it had an action and there's no right or wrong thing to do here. It just is the thing. Anyways, I'm just going off about just this level, you know, just this first room, but anyways. Um, okay. So here come, these, these are all the bats from level two. Um, all right. Here we have, um, the alcove of the bats, which is room three. Uh, there's a buried statue of Athena, and there's still a bunch of bats here. The stone doorway to room four is jammed shut. It requires a strength check to open. The room door to room five is ajar. Well, then how is it a door? Anyways, there are numerous tracks back and forth between rooms four and five. But again, we've seen bats, we've seen bats, but we've seen the tracks too, if someone was paying attention. So you know that there's got to be more than just bats here, right? Then level uh, room four, which is to the left, we have the centipede chapel. This is free of guano. There's a pile of rubble Go through here. And there are 19 tiny monstrous scorpions. There was recently a struggle in the room. Many centipedes are smashed on the floor. Their brothers are currently devouring their remains. Some blood is smeared on the door in the shape of a claw and drips of lizard floak blood are all about the room. So again, there's a lot of information here along with tiny monstrous centipedes, but they're, they're foreshadowing. There are other creatures here. The centipedes were apparently being fought or hunted maybe by the lizard folk because there's lizard folk blood, there's dead centipedes. Again, it's building this up to it. And we know, you know, in, from the, the footprints, assuming they were, you know, man-shaped, humanoid-shaped, you go, okay, well, the centipedes didn't make these. The bats didn't make these. And then you see the lizard folk blood and you go, okay, so there are lizard folk nearby. And sure enough, when you go to room five, there is a lizard folk on a hunting foray and they, uh, uh, you know, have, uh, 
you know, have, uh, um, they're guarding the door while they're trying to heal. Now, I don't need to tell you that even though this is third edition, this is a, 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 a great point where this doesn't have to be a combat. If you don't have a problem with the lizard folk, then maybe you talk to them or maybe you try to get information from them. Maybe they know something. Maybe somebody speaks their language and that actually means something. But you don't have to fight them. You don't have to encounter them. This isn't critical to the success of the adventure. And then, of course, what it wouldn't be a great thing. We get to our first instance of a secret door. Because you can see on the map that on the back side of room five, in the corner of the room are the remains of a statue. The statue is shattered beyond any recognition. The rest of the alcove is a series of ornate stone panels. One of the panels is a secret door that leads to a hallway. So already we have, a, if characters are back there, they're investigating the alcove, they're looking at the broken statue, you might say, oh, hey, you find a secret door. I should also point out one of the things I loved about third edition. You can see that the search DC here is 20, which is pretty high. It's not going to be super easy to make that, but third edition had take 20. So if somebody basically said, I'm going to spend a couple of minutes and I'm really going to look over this area, then you're like, okay, well, you take 20, you got a 21 or 22 or 23 as your total, um, you know, even if you're not really that trained in it and you would find the secret door. I like that style of secret door finding. Um, anyways, I could keep going on and on and on, uh, about this marvelous dungeon, but already you, you've had, you know, and then by the way, like, you know, the next encounter is there is a spear trap. Then we find more of those gnolls, you know, that are tied to the beast men and to the Minotaur King that we encountered, uh, uh up at the top or the top temple. And then there's the chapel of Thanatos, the crypt of the waking dead, um, there's more undead, more undead, even more undead. Um, and again, it's 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 telling the story of these factions. It's telling the story of the history of this dungeon. But it's doing it through fun adventures and treasure and monsters and fighting and traps and all the cool stuff. It's not boring. It's exciting because this place is scary. You don't know what's raiding around the corner. Look, remember, this is a level three. It says... For four to six characters of levels third to eighth level. And you can see here, like, okay, here's an EL3, right? That's a level three encounter. Here's an EL4. Okay, still doable. But look what's on level one of this dungeon. An EL8. There's six skeletons and a male cleric to purveyor of mortality. Five, which is a custom prestige class. God save us from third edition. Um. But, you know, that guy alone is a CR7. A little bit deeper, the oracular skull is an EL13. The upper reaches is an EL9. We have an EL7. So some of these encounters aren't just something that you could, number one, maybe you shouldn't, you should completely avoid it entirely. And number two, maybe you need to be, you can't just beat it with the combat math. You can't just beat the encounter by going, I'm going to throw my dice at you and you're going to throw your dice at me. And because the game is balanced for me to win, I'm going to win. It doesn't work that way, right? There's more to it than just, you know, spamming your dice rolls and your strikes against people. So um, just just a, an awesome and incredible uh, situation. And by the way, we come all the way back here to room 18, uh, down here in the lower right-hand corner, stairs 18, which is stairs to the surface. This is the other way that we might have. So, so, Everything we were talking about, the bat, like someone goes, oh yeah, the bats, that was so awesome. Did you guys get ambushed by the by the undead while the bats were swarming around you? And someone, someone else goes, what undead? What bats? No, no, no. Like we came down the stairs and we came into the room with all like the tribal people that were decorated in like bones and and uh, had, had sort of worshipped death as a god. Uh, the sanctuary of the dark one. There was that uh, flame trap spell. Like what, what part are you talking about? Are we, did we play the same module? Yeah, you did. One of you went in through the temple of Zeus and the other one uh, went in through the temple of Thanatos. One of you started in room one. The other one started in room 18 or location 18. So that to me is very cool. <laughs> like I love that you can have that level of different experience before we've even really started playing the whole game. As a note, by the way, look at our map here, 23. Um, so that's located 
right here out over this big, huge chasm, okay, um, and rent in the earth. But this 23, this is where we can climb the rope down from the surface here on the left-hand side of the map. And potentially, if our characters are brave, like, I mean, they can start off right in the midst of the dungeon. Because think about it. If you think about it, the encounter rooms are going up as the danger increases, right? And so it's like, oh, well, level one, that's made, that's the earliest encounter. Level six, room 16 in the bottom right, that's even tougher. If you take the rope down, you're going to be starting in room 23. So you're like really, you know, kind of ahead of where you're supposed to be, but potentially you could have some good time for it. Or you could not because you're going down into the sacrificial altar of the dark one, EL 12 ceremony or nine dire baths. It could be horrible for you, but imagine it more like not as a fight. Imagine it like the scene from Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom, right? Where they infiltrate the Temple of Doom for the first time. Short round, uh, is it Winnie? What's, what, what is Indy's love interest? Kate Capshaw plays her, um, who married Steven Spielberg. Um, is it Winnie? I don't remember her name. Anyways, it's, it's a male name. Anyways, uh, short round the blonde and Indiana Jones, they sneak into the temple of doom. Now that encounter might be an EL 12 because there's, you know, Molaram and all the guards and all the followers, but they're not there to fight. They're there to sneak around. They're there to gather information. They're there, they're there to find out what's going on. Willie. Thank you. Uh, Solano is close. Billy, you are right. It is Willie, Willie Scott. All right. Thank you. Thank you for that. So you, imagine, imagine you're playing this adventure and you, you find this thing and you listen and you hear drums in the deep and you tie a rope to an ancient broken column on the surface. And there's just this sort of yawning pit of black darkness in the, you know, in the midst of this crumbling stone courtyard. And you begin descending down the rope hand over hand with a soft red glowing from the bottom. And as you kind of come down the rope, you are, you know, you land on a small ledge overlooking a vast vault a ceremonial place where uh Ta tavas mock and four death walker guards and 10 death walker commoners are intended as witnesses as three captured villagers from the surrounding communities in the jungle are about to be sacrificed i mean this is literally temple of doom i mean that and and, and like that you can, that's awesome I, I, that's what I want out of an adventure. Like, and the party's like, can we fight these? Uh, no. And like, you know, we have to sneak around. We have to, we have to be quiet, right? We have to avoid the fight. You know, that's awesome. You know? So love to see it. Love, uh, love everything about it. So, uh, you know, this is, um, this is just level one of the caverns of Thracia. And again, uh, you know, there's more to come. <laughs> and, and this is just the first level. You know, there's four or five levels of this thing, okay? And you're going to be able to have these incredible moments and these incredible stories from that. And that is, you know, at the end of the day, that is the power of what Janelle was able to do in this game. She was able to, in my opinion, turn dungeons into the sort of awesome narrative kind of places that we, that they can be. And she took that and applied it to her video game design. She took that and applied it to her role-playing game. And... For me, this was just so, such an incredible pillar of not only how I like to GM, but also like how I like to play. Like this is the kind of adventure and this is the kind of experience that I, you know, I want when I want my D&D. &D. Now, of course, there are times where I want to play Avatar Legends and I want to talk about my feelings. Um, thank you, Entropy Nomad. Uh, you know, for that tip, uh, for that super chat. I have enjoyed your case study tonight. Great GM content. Ever talk GMing with others like Runehammer? Uh, Entropy, sometimes I have guests on the show. Uh, not as often as Runehammer does. Um, but it's something that I have thought about doing. Uh, I know some of my patrons think uh, it would be cool to get some more guests on. It's maybe from other areas. We've always been so small. I've always felt like other people aren't going to want to bother with us. Um, but, you know, we're over 10,000 subs now, right? We're we're, we're slowly inching our way towards, you know, being on somebody's radar. Um, but yeah, uh, I, I, I definitely think it could be very interesting. And uh, I have some ideas about trying to bring more people onto the show. But also, there are many instances where we have guests or even people from my own patron who I consider to be 
you know, just as, just as worthy or if not better than some of these content creators, um, in terms of my, you know, respect for their opinions and, and learning from them. And they've been on the show and that's always been very, very useful. Um, and while I really appreciate that super chat entropy nomad, I would be remiss as we wrap up to not once again, remind you, uh, if you've not maybe already done so, or if you have a couple of bucks to spare, there is a link in the description below to, um, Janelle's GoFundMe, which will now be used by her um, wife to cover outstanding medical debt and funeral costs. And, you know, again, I cannot express again uh, my deepest condolences and sympathy for anyone who uh, loved her, knew her, worked with her, was, you know, personally, closely, tightly related to her. I only knew her through her work, through her video games, through her RPG experiences. And so, you know, it was very much a indirect impact. But, you know, this module, the, the Xandering the Dungeon concept and games like Quake and Hexen um, were just a big part of how I view RPGs, how I view adventures, especially, you know, fantasy dungeon adventuring. And as a result, you know, I can say that a lot, a lot of this uh, is, you know, from Janelle. So, you know, from, from a, a, a casual and um, uh, lifelong fan, you know, Janelle, thank you for everything that you did for this hobby and I, I hope that you have found peace and um, I, I really hope that uh, your family is able to you know, honor and remember your legacy and your blessing and may your memory be a blessing. Um, Jason, damn it. Did I miss the whole thing again? Jason, you did miss the whole thing again. We are, we are signing off. Um, so um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Thanks you everybody for hanging out with me tonight. Um, hopefully you kind of learned a little bit about Xandering the Dungeon, the inspiration for that, why Janelle Jaquez was so important for that, and why Caverns of Thracia was such, for me, such an inspiration, and why it was such an inspiration for other people like Justin Alexander, who literally came and, you know, wrote a whole philosophy or system of dungeon design based off of this sort of revolutionary nature of Caverns of Thracia. And again, I think you can find this version of the module, which is the Necromancer Games module, uh, that you can find on Drive RPG. Um, and if you do wanna, if you do end up buying it from Drive RPG, we do have an affiliate link, I think maybe in the description below. I think I tried to take out, or at least I moved them down. I took out like our tip links for this because I really want people to go to the GoFundMe. But if you are gonna pick it up, um, uh, maybe uh, use our affiliate link so we get a couple uh, uh, extra bucks. It doesn't cost you anything extra, but it does give us credit, which it's not actual money. It's just credit at drive through RPG, which I use to buy PDF so we can do more deep dives and first looks and all that other stuff. So, um, so thank you everybody for coming out. Thank you. Entropy nomad for your super chat. Um, and again, uh, if you haven't done so already, um, you know, maybe, uh, uh, uh drop a couple bucks at, uh, Janelle's GoFundMe. So thank you, everybody, and we will see you next time on Nights of Last Call. Bye, everybody.